major intern at CDI. And my major is in politics government with a minor in national security. And I'm going to go ahead and recognize uh, the Mayor Lamb. Before we begin our program today, we would like to take a moment to recognize the 12 first nations that reside the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. Among them, nations of Hocha, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Manali, Mohican, Oneida, and the Brother Town. We honor the history of resistance and resilience to give us a scared space today to share with you today. Thank you, Alicia. Welcome, everyone. My name is Maria Mendoza Bautista. I am the Director of Multicultural Affairs here at Rubin College in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. I'd like to do an introduction to our program today. The murder of George Floyd on May 25, 2020 propelled many U.S. City cities, including Rubin, to examine police and community relations. The systemic foundations of policing have come under question, as some incidents have compromised the safety of citizens across the United States. These incidents captured on smartphone videos have documented police and citizen interactions that at times have crossed racial lines, have led to violence, and have resulted in murder and death. We are also experiencing a transformation of police departments as they examine their role and relationship to our communities, i.e. change in culture, accountability, training, policies, and practices, all of which require strong leadership and transparency. This past year has been most unprecedented in many ways. On behalf of the Inclusion Audit Student Success Retention Subcommittee, the responses received around campus safety vary tremendously at times. As you can imagine, it was also the year of COVID restrictions, Zoom instruction, bias incidents, social media frenzy, mostly uncertainty. We have been working this past year to continue difficult conversations with entities that provide safety on campus, such as our students, administration, residence life, Ripon Police Department, community groups, etc. Our focus is always student-centered, and we are continuously assessing student voices, testimonials, and ways that we can all improve. Thank you to Brenda Gabrielson, Director of the Francine Center, and students Alicia Harbutt, class of 21, Brent Davis, class of 22, and Cassidy Walters, class of 23, for their tremendous support this past year in helping us find focus and organization to bring this program to you today. The Ribbon College Campus Climate Survey was administered during the fall 2020 semester over a period of three weeks. There were 308 total responses. 307 of the total responses were student responses. 217 of those responses were anonymous student responses. One was an alumni response. This report will address the 307 student responses. There were five sections in the survey, demographic snapshot, general campus climate, college safety, perceptions of leadership, policies, and reporting, and Wisconsin state law, campus security, college police. Each section also allowed for student comments. The total responses varied per section, as students did not have to respond to each question. For, but for the most part, they did. Demographic information from the enrolled fall 2020 student respondents resulted in a majority of self-identified females, 62% or 190 respondents, followed by self-identified males, 34%, 104 respondents, 
and lower percentages of students who self-identified in this section as transgender male, genderqueer, non-conforming, and other. Further demographic breakdowns for ethnicity and race supports the cultural diversity that represents some of the Ripon College student body. The class year for each student was critical to identify in order to begin to assess some of the needs of each unique student. <clears throat> Students responded to feeling safe. That is the ethnicity and race. When asked about safety outside of campus grounds within the Ripon uh, community during the evening or night, 51% of students responded, responded to feeling safe with a rating of four and five on the Likert scale survey. Campus climate survey, this next, this next section asks students about two specific entities. My apologies. Campus climate survey, this next section asks students about two specific entities, City of Ripon Police Department and Campus Security. As you can see on question 11 in this section, 85% of students responded to a not applicable response to their overall satisfaction to Ribbon PD response of incidents on campus. Our analysis concluded that these 177 respondents simply had not had to dispatch RPD, Ribbon Police Department, and could not fully assess their services. When asked about the presence of both RPD and campus security on campus grounds, overwhelming neutral responses again tell us that students simply could not form an opinion due to the non-use of services provided by either entity. The following are student comments that were submitted along with this data collection and the five sections, demographics, general camp general climate, college safety, perception of leadership policies, reporting, and lastly, Wisconsin state law. Campus security, city of Ripon police. Some of these comments are the premise to our conversation today and have helped us this year to really begin to discuss safety at Ripon College and delve into better ways to serve our students. I'll just read a few of these. It should be easier and more well known how to report an incident of sexual assault. Also, more action should be taken to protect students who make a report. I would recommend more lighting on campus by the wooded area due to dim light at night. The administration does not provide support until it's too late. They do not take action as soon as possible. I love Ripon College and the classroom environment in most cases. However, with the election, a couple of my professors have confessed their political beliefs to the class in a way that is degrading. Regardless of our beliefs, I don't believe professors should use their authority to manipulate our political viewpoint. I have never seen campus security. I did not realize that they were separate from the Ripon police. Maybe when there are those Title IX trainings in Catalyst, they can pop in and introduce themselves to students so that those on campus can become familiar with them. When I went through a difficult time last year, my professors and counselor, counselor went above and beyond to make sure I was okay, both mentally and academically. I do feel safe, however, this is a thing of privilege. There are people that don't feel safe on this campus. The administration could increase people's sense of safety if they held groups of students responsible for their actions. As you can imagine, we have had some very difficult conversations 
And um, all of this is to support students and uh, their voices and their safety. I'm going to introduce my um, my colleague, Brenda Gribota, who did I? Did you want to go over some of that data as well? I probably missed a whole bunch of that. <laughs> I'll introduce Brenda, who reviewed some of that data that we just reviewed. Thank you, Brenda. some work to do, um, but it, it's a positive for me. Thank you, Brenda. Our Red Hawk, Red Hawk Safety Combo today will be comprised of representatives from various entities that we have continued to have difficult conversations with. We will also be hearing from students through some very powerful, anonymously written and submitted student testimonials read by our student CDI intern. To welcome our panelists in our campus community today is Ripping College, President Zach Massetti. students who helped organize this event. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Brenda and the work that she and Maria have been doing to compile that survey that you just saw. It took a lot of time and effort and thought went into it. Um, and, you know, I think um, I'm someone, I know my administrative colleagues believe that we can always improve as a college and there's good evidence in their work of areas where we can do better. Um, I want to intro a few people and recognize a few folks. Sitting up here in the front row is the person who's going to be replacing me uh, in about six weeks, Andrea Young. And I think all of us ought to give a nice welcome to Andrea. <laughs> has uh, been uh, sort of done a lot of different things at the college. Originally she was a mathematics professor here um, and then she worked in the president's office and then she was the interim dean of faculty and is now uh, the vice president for finance and also runs strategic initiatives and I know because I've had many conversations with her that this is a topic that she cares a lot about. So I'm only here for another six weeks to two months but the person who's coming in is the interim president um, really cares about these issues. Um, over the past year, I've been able to attend quite a number of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion events, um, including the presentation 
last week um, on Thursday um, on refugee children at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and what I appreciate about all of the CDI events that I've been to is how actively engaged our students are in the planning and actual presentation of the events, and that's true again today. I'd like to also take a moment here to welcome Professor Alan Johnson, who is here from Marion University. As many of you know, um, Griffin and Marion are working to try and figure out how to collaborate more on lots of different issues. And so it's terrific that he's here today as well. Finally, I want to recognize uh, Chief Walner, who's here at the end of the table, and officers Michaels and Herring, who are here from the Ribbon Police Department. Now, many of you may know this, some of you may not, but officers Herring and Michael are both Ribbon College alumni. And so we are extra proud of both of them. No offense, Chief Walner, we're, we're not as proud of you, but we're more proud of them. Um, so well, welcome to them, and again, it's good that you all, students and faculty and staff, know that there are a couple of officers on the Ripon Police Force who also went to college here. Um, over the last nine plus years that I've been president, we have worked on dozens of issues, large and small, with the Ripon Police Force, um, some of which people know about and others people do not know about. Um, I can tell you this about the three individuals that are here today. They are shining examples of what it means to be a public servant. They care about the community. They care about the college. And uh, I know them, and I know that they always try and do the right thing. So thank you to the three of you for being here today. It's really, it really means a lot to us. Um, so I look forward to the discussion that's coming and sort of the back and forth between all of you here uh, as well, but thank you all for being here. This is an important discussion, one that should continue on well beyond today. So thank you, and then who do I turn this back to, Maria? Great, thanks everyone. Cassidy Walters is one of our students and will be introducing our facilitator for Thank you, President Massetti, for the warm welcome today. Today, we'd like to welcome our facilitator for this Red Hawk Safety Combo, Professor Alan Johnson, who is, like, like President Massetti recognized, is joining us from Marion University. Professor Johnson, JD, is the Director of Criminal Justice and Homeland Security Programs at Marion University. He is a retired Milwaukee Police Lieutenant, where he served for 26 years. Professor Johnson has been teaching Marion students since 2004 and has been a full-time faculty member since 2014. He likes to use his real-world experience gained as a police officer and lawyer to explain the criminal justice system in ways that makes the theoretical and practical work together. He believes that students are able to understand the lessons and apply them to per to their professional exploits better if they understand the nuisances and reasons behind their actions. Having attended a technical college and transferring to Marquette University to complete his degree in criminal justice and his law degree, Professor Johnson has a strong understanding of the challenges that students face in balancing their personal lives, families, education, and employment. He assists students with their journey as a student advisor and mentor. Here is Alan Jackson. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Cassidy, and Dr. Massetti, and Maria, and everybody else who's here today. Um, thank you for making me feel welcome here at Ripon. Um, it's actually the first time I've been on campus in probably 30 years. And, um, but I do remember uh, how beautiful the campus is, and this is a great day for it. So, um, Interestingly, if they asked me to uh, kind of talk a little bit about the history of law enforcement and criminal justice in America, and it's one of those topics that, uh, depending on what criminologist and, and professor that you talk to, you might get a little bit of a different answer. So I've kind of, um, we actually, in a lot of the classes I teach over at Marion, um, we actually take a couple of class sessions to kind of go through this material in our introductory courses. So let me give you five to 10 minutes on it. So it's gonna be kind of quick, but just kind of give you a little bit of the background or kind of understanding on 
on, on what, what's kind of happened. Um, first of all, you have to kind of go back to you can't have law enforcement without laws. So uh, many of those kind of go back about 2000 BC, Code of Hammur, uh, Hammurabi, and some of you may remember that from senior history and civics classes, and some of the biblical and religious sort of um, edicts uh, throughout history. So you know things in the Bible like thou shalt not kill and things like that that kind of lay the groundwork for what will happen uh, in society when it comes to laws and behaviors that are accept <clears throat> excuse me, acceptable and not acceptable. Um, you go back in, in history for the most part, um, people you know, were hunters and gatherers and they lived in clans and small villages. Um, so they kind of took care of problems themselves. Um, the Native American experience probably is, is probably the most similar to that um, in, in America where um, if something went, someone did something to offend or violate another person of that, that tribe or village or clan or group, um, it was kind of handled in house. Um, they took care of it within the within the tribe. Um, elders would be involved um, to some extent. The people who were aggrieved. Uh, so if um, kind of go back to the, the European experience in many respects, if someone stole someone's goat or you know livestock or somehow or other violated the other person, you know, with a physical attack or something like that. Usually the, the victims and the, the offenders would get together sometimes with others in the community sort of supervising that discussion and determine what they were going to do about it. Uh, there were no prisons, jails, things like that. Um, the, the solutions usually involved some version of um, the, the, the victims um, getting some kind of benefit back from the, the persons who violated them. So maybe they would do extra work for them or provide them a goat in return for what they did to them or something like that. Um, there's a lot of varieties of this over the years. Um, you know, you kind of are, are going to have issues where sometimes there was no real solution. The person did something that was so evil, so terrible to that community that they had to come up with another option. Um, so that's where you hear things like banishment. Uh, they, they kicked them out of the village. Um, obviously, there's other things like death penalties that were imposed upon the, the violators. But most of this stuff was done sort of within the, within the confines of the community and the village. Um, this kind of grows as, as society starts to evolve a little bit and becomes more urban to some levels. Um, you know, the Middle Ages and things like that, it continues to evolve. Um, the kings and the nobles kind of take over this. The, the elite uh, ruling class kind of takes over some of these responsibilities of kind of putting down the laws as to what's acceptable and not acceptable. And obviously, people are fallible. And, you know, they make mistakes and they sometimes are not the most ethical and honest people. And um, some of these leaders would obviously take advantage of their power and position to continue to um, keep themselves in power by passing laws and accusing people of things like treason and things like that that they would issue death penalties for. Um, this experience sort of continues to kind of grow, um, taking the American system, um, it's very much sort of based on the European and especially the British-English criminal justice system because that tends to be where the um, colonization of America came from. Um, there's also some elements of French and Spanish um, influence, especially um, in some of the southern places. Louisiana uh, had both at different times um, kind of ruling in that area. And um, actually when I went to law school, one of the um, common thoughts was when we go through and study different laws, um, often the professor would say, this applies everywhere in America except Louisiana, uh, because Louisiana still has some weird kind of rules once in a while. But for the most part, America as it, as it stands today was very strongly influenced by that British, European, judicial, legal system. And around the time of American colonization, it was really the king and the nobles that were kind of enforcing and creating laws that were enforced by the military. So if you kind of think back to the American Revolution in your history classes and such, you had the red coats and whatever coming into villages and kind of laying down the law. Um, so the military is enforcing things. Um, prior to this, 
time period though, in Europe you start getting, what they start to figure out this isn't really working real well. We need to have a little bit better system in place. So the, the sheriff sort of system starts to kind of take over, um, which basically is there's like one out of every hundred was kind of the original theory would be kind of in charge in the village of keeping the peace or being in charge. This is where you get these stories like Robin Hood, Sheriff of Nottingham, things like that. There was that sort of system during this period of time. But it wasn't really a, you weren't really a paid government employee for the most part. You might receive some level of compensation, but it was minimal. And the people of the village kind of took care of you. Not all that different than um, early education systems where the people of the village kind of took care of their teachers. Um, so as the American colonies um, start to evolve, and obviously we lead up to the Revolutionary War, you get this situation in which the, um, this experience that they've had with the British leads to a lot of the, 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 the language that's in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Um, so this is where we get First Amendment rights, free speech, Fourth Amendment rights against uh, illegal searches and seizures, Eighth Amendment against unreasonable and, and cruel punishment because the Brits had a habit of chopping limbs off and killing people and things like that. So a lot of these influences come together from this, this European experience. Um, when the Americas kind of start off then in late 1700s, early 1800s as its own country, um, generally the law enforcement was still pretty limited. It was still sort of this sheriff sort of system, but it wasn't a formalized system. Um, and eventually what happens is uh, 1829, we believe, is about the first uh, formal police department in, in London, the London Metropolitan Police Department. And the influence from that starts to grow on the East Coast. So we still continue to copy sort of the British experience. We get law enforcement agencies in places like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, some of the older American cities. And they start taking on some of the characteristics of the British system again. Even though we've kind of broken free from them, we were still kind of followed through with kind of some of what they do. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the things that were in a minute here. But um, especially now, the history books are starting to kind of rethink a little bit of this period in time and, and what happened in the original implementation of law enforcement. And we're still doing research and, and going back through records and people are still kind of talking about this, but um, you can't really ignore the fact that although we had these sheriff's departments in a lot of rural areas that were, weren't really departments per se, they were just sort of a sheriff who was sort of put in charge. Um, in the southern parts of the, the U.S. we had slave patrols that were very similar to sheriff's departments as we kind of see it today. There was someone in charge, they would get a posse when they're looking for someone. If you think of old West movies, Clint Eastwood and stuff, hey, we're, we're going looking for the stagecoach robber who wants to go with me and you go off with people. Um, not all that different from that, that slave patrol experience in the South where they would try to capture or escape slaves. But most formal police today, uh, at the local level at least anyway, kind of follow that original sort of London and East Coast Boston, New York police, uh, police sort of structure. Um, a lot of those departments have tended to be fairly corrupt over the last 100 to 150 years uh, in the early stages. The people weren't very well educated. The, the qualifications often, if you find old job applications for police officers for like New York, Milwaukee, Chicago, any of the, the cities that were growing in the mid-1800s, often it would say we're looking for white males who are big and strong. Um, because basically you had to, it's not like you could call for help on your police radio, there was no radio. Um, if you were going to try to apprehend someone, you had to physically overcome their resistance and drag them to, to court or jail or whatever they were using at the time. So they tended to look for very large, uh, very, not people who necessarily would think independently, but people who would listen to orders, kind of a militaristic sort of style of, of policing. Um, that tended to, to start to evolve a little bit after World War II a little bit more professionalization, um, but for the most part, professionalization in American law enforcement really didn't kick in until the civil rights era of the 1960s through the early 70s. There was some federal legislation involved in trying to encourage that as well. So it's gone through a lot of changes over the years, and then in the, in the, after the 70s, they start professionalizing, and you start seeing people in law enforcement with real educations, so actually going through formal police academy and training rather than just getting hired one day and you're a police officer in the 90s. Um, but then in the 80s and 90s, we, in, as a country, just kind of real quick in the last few years, uh, in my life, I, um, we had a very um, significant sort of push towards law enforcement being kind of a strong crime suppression kind of element. 
um, back in the 80s, uh, in my age, I remember the Just Say No to Drugs commercials and things like that. And um, there was a very uh, bigger um, use of police power to kind of enforce and lock people up. That continued pretty much through the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. And now we're in another period where people are starting to say, hey, wait a second, this maybe isn't quite working. We've got a lot of people locked up. So we're going through another transition in America, which was part of the reason why we're all here today, to try to figure out what the, the future of that is. A um, couple of the key points that I think are kind of interesting. So I mentioned that first law enforcement uh, agency in London in 1829. Sir Robert Peel um, was the kind of inventor and creator of it. Uh, there's a reason why the London police are called Bobbies, because Robert, short for Robert, is Bob. So if you work for Robert Peel, you're a Bobby. Um, they also used to call them Peelers. That's another nickname that you hear in England. You don't hear that much here. But, um, in 1829, he came up with a couple core principles of policing that I think still apply today and are kind of interesting that they're almost 200 years old. Um, number one was the goal is preventing crime, not catching criminals. That was his first principle. So it wasn't about let's just catch people, let's prevent it from happening in the first place. And a lot of people think that American law enforcement kind of got away from that for a while. Number two is that the key to preventing crime is earning public support. Every community member must share the responsibility of preventing crime as if they were all volunteer members of the force. They will only accept this responsibility if the community supports and trusts the police. I know it sounds like some language that we're hearing on a regular basis today. And the last one was the police earn public support by respecting community principles. Winning public approval requires hard work to build reputation. Enforcing the laws impartially, hiring officers who represent and understand the community, and using force only as a last resort. Um, so these are kind of, you see this language in some of the recommendations that you see from some of the commissions that are going on today to re uh, reform policing, but these were written 200 years ago. So I kind of find that very, very interesting and um, that, that maybe we lost track of some of that over the years. So hopefully again, that gets a kind of a quick sort of summary of kind of what got us here and kind of where we're at maybe a little bit. Um, and I think at this point, I'm supposed to um, add a little more information here. So all right, this conversation will focus um, today as we continue forward on uh, supporting uh, student safety on and off campus. Uh, anonymous, non-identified student testimonials will be shared, depicting some uncomfortable and at times also racially biased interactions in and outside of Ripon College. In addition, some student stories will also share favorable outcomes where they found support for their safety. We will hear from Ripon residents alike about safety measures on campus. The Ripon Police Department will share components of training for officers and community building. And the local area, the local Ripon Area Racial Justice Alliance will share how their efforts support both students and community members. We will learn about bridging police community relations for a stronger Red Hawk community at Ripon College. So a couple of uh, things I'd like to remind everybody, hopefully this isn't uh, gonna be a problem, but just um, kind of keep it in your mind. Please be uh, curious and listen uh, to understand. Uh, show respect and suspect judgment. Note any common ground as well as any differences. Uh, please be authentic and welcome that from others. Uh, be purposeful and to the point and own and guide the conversation as best as you can. So um, there'll be students who also like to be the kind, um, be part of the conversation. Uh, and for, for protection, their individual um, identities will be remaining anonymous, but we're gonna read some of their testimonials. Um, so first off, I've got uh, a couple of interns from the Center of Diversity and Inclusion. So Hannah will be the first one. Hi everybody, my name is Hannah Brockman. I'm a second year student here at Ripon College, uh, majoring in Spanish and French with a minor in educational studies. An older lady near the pharmacy across the campus fell on the ground. I rushed to help as she had groceries. She started screaming for help because she thought I was trying to rob her. 
A bypasser was calling the cops when I decided to take off. I was volunteering at a church on Sunday for the children's ministry. When a parent came to pick up their child, he was furious and stated that he will not be bringing his son to that, this church again. A pastor in Urban said that he would rather deal with black people in Africa than African Americans. That is, this community nags and complains and wants white people to do everything for them. This is when I stopped attending churches in Urban and started listening to pastors in Ripon, Wisconsin. When I was having these past two years have been really eye-opening to me. I would like to recall the Ahmad Arbery story that took place on February 23rd, 2020. Ahmad Arbery, an unarmed 25 year old black man, was pursued while jogging near Brunswick in Glen County, Georgia. He was pursued by three white residents. They were armed and drove a pickup truck, uh, another vehicle. Ahmad uh, was stopped, confronted, and fairly shot and killed. I see myself as a black man. I am also a cross country runner and track and field athlete for the college. What happened to him hit me most because obviously I would go running on a daily basis this summer and go around the Olympic community. But the fear of possibly getting shot and killed because of the color of my skin really hit me. Everything that has been happening these past few weeks makes me feel that it's very necessary for us black people and also for everyone of color, including white people, to come together as one and fight this racism because it's something that has been going on for over 400 plus years and there's something that needs to be done about it. Program to empower black students to work in college and university. My name is uh, Luis Aragon Miranda. I'm a senior at Ripon College, uh, and I'm studying sociology and anthropology. My friend and I were going to the local quick trip to grab some skillet Velveeta one night between 8 and 10 p.m. When we went to the store, my friend pumped some gas. I headed towards the store, and a guy, a white male presenting student from Ripon College, held the door open for me. I said, thank you. He scoffed. He was going out the door, and I was going in. I got what I needed and got back to the cash register and car. The guy and his friends were still parked in front of the store. Four to five people were in the car. The guy who held open the door shouted the N-word with a hard R to me as I entered my friend's passenger door. My friend looked at me in disbelief. I'm looking down, hoping that they didn't say what I think they said. When this person shouted this to me, they drove away. My friend kept asking if I was okay. Inside my mind, I kept thinking about how that would play out in my hometown where I could defend myself better. I feel isolated and ripping. I feel like a freak of nature. I feel isolated out. We saw the car at the stop sign where they were parked. When we passed the, their car, they followed us closely. When we passed the Dollar General, they followed up and turned right. We went home. I felt scared for my friend, for her safety, for her car, that something horrible could happen to us. I kept asking, why? What's going on? Once we made the turn to the left, my friend asked if Ripon is a sundown town. I googled it. Appleton and a few other towns I do not remember are sundown towns. Those areas are close enough that I confirmed my suspicions. My friend had to drive in a different direction in order to have them follow, in order to not have them follow us home. There was a great amount of shock, disbelief, and fear. The safety factor here made me feel vulnerable, not protected. I was not home. Being from a bigger city, you're not an eyesore. Going to school back home was diverse. When you get older, you see how people put their thoughts and opinions. Being here, I had never realized that I had to look less harmful in order to appear more friendly. 
Racial profiling is real in Ripon. It's the first time this racial slur was directed towards me in my life. When I got to my room, I started bawling out of fear. Anger set in. I was frightened, scared, feared for my life. I started second guessing the reasons for me coming here. Second guessing my safety. My two friends reached out. I was quiet. I kept saying, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But I was empty. I was tired of crying. I was not able to enjoy the presence of my friends without having that setback take an emotional toll on me. There's work to do in this community. There needs to be further education to white folk in town, leaning away from the white savior complex. Sincerity in white spaces comes off as, you're trying to be my savior. The communication needs to be direct and invested in our communities of color, that our presence matters has to be present in your actions. Good morning, my name is Chris Ogle, the Vice President of Dean of Students. I'm going to talk just briefly about bias reporting so everybody knows how that system works. I do want to start, though, and, and reiterate something that President Bassetti said, that uh, given my role here as a dean of students for decades, um, it's always been reassuring for, I think, not only me, but my colleagues in student life, that we've been able to develop a really good relationship with local law enforcement. And the fact that they're two blocks away has really been handy that some schools really don't have the luxury of having. And just to give you a context, I mean, some of the things over the years where they've offered their services are, we've had thefts on campus, certainly some of the most severe situations are when we're dealing with a possible suicide situation and prevention and their assistance there. Sexual assault was mentioned earlier, parking issues either here on campus or nearby, medical emergencies which happen frequently and they're often the first ones here to offer assistance. We've had some issues with drug dealing on campus. They've offered their assistance on occasion in the city of Ripon, not often, but on occasion we've had some incidents with outside intruders to campus. They've always been very helpful there. Um, offering student internships for us in the community. It's been a great experience and has led to some of our graduates getting positions. When we've had the really big events on campus, some of them here in Great Hall or commencement or things like that, they're often here to offer their assistance as well. And if you've seen the mess in front of Bartlett, I mean, that's the most recent situation where we had a pipe break and a major flood, and Lindsay was telling me she was one of the first ones here yesterday morning trying to figure out what's going on and get us assistance. So just a shout out to all of you. I really appreciated that assistance over the years. Great partners. So at the bias protocol, um, this is something that's got a lot of profile on college campuses today as to how you're gonna balance issues related to bias. I think there's the one side of preserving the value of free speech, uh, particularly on a college campus that's promoting the exchange, exchange of free ideas where they can be tested and evaluated and, and defended in some ways. And how does that balance up against the quality of interactions we want in a sense of community? And where did it come to odds? So because of that, the college did develop a bias protocol procedure where if someone feels like they've been wronged in some way, they can submit something in writing and get it into us to be evaluated. It's easy to do now. You can go on the website or on the portal, click on a link where bias is, and you just follow yourself through and it'll get sent through. The response to them is the vice president of, and dean of faculty and myself do an early evaluation. We do have other faculty and staff then that serve as support to help evaluate and do an investigation if that's determined to be necessary. Residence Life staff has been trained on this, as has many of our staff, so if you're ever in a situation or know someone who is, feel free to refer them to us and we can help walk them through the situation. And then we do our best to try to have a resolution that fits the circumstances that are there. So 
it's probably a program, maybe four or five years that's been in place. Um, some years used more than others, and um, we definitely want to be here to provide assistance for those that have been in a difficult circumstance. I, mean, I think that's part of our ethos of who we are and the community we're trying to establish. And I believe, Mark, you're going to speak next. So thank you for being here today. Hi there. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm here to talk about Res Life and what is our role. So I'm Mark Nicholas. I'm the director of Res Life. I also help oversee the campus security and safety here at River College. So on this slide, this has been distributed out. It's in the residence halls. It's on the website. Um, when all of you were incoming freshmen, you received it um, in your packets. And this is our emergency numbers that we have on campus and how you can report an incident, whether it's a crime, it's an incident in general, or just some suspicious activity that you might have. Um, so we have several different numbers listed. You're more than welcome to call almost any one of those, but some of them are specific. So if you live in the Taj area, we have the Taj phone number up there listed. Um, that will get you to a Taj RA to give a quicker response if it happens in tri or Johnson. Um, and then on there, um, we have RAs. They are on duty. They do rounds um, seven days a week from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. They are on duty during that time. Obviously not during the daytime because that is when they're in classes, as you all are aware, they're students. Um, but they're on rounds. So they're our first line of emergency response or incident response on campus. Um, we also have on there, if you need to get a hold of counseling services, a number that you can contact. We have two fantastic counselors on campus. They are also unique in that they are also, um, they're confidential. So you can talk to them about any concerns you might have without worry about that, that information might get reported up or out. Um, so we have the numbers on there. We also have emergency numbers. So if you have a true emergency where you need um, life safety support or something, we have access to calling the police, the fire, the EMS, the Ripon Medical Center. If you need to get a SANE, a SANE is a sexual assault nurse examiner. We do have one of those located in Fond du Lac, so we don't have one in Ripon, but we do have one in the county. We have a number on how to get in touch with them. And then down below, we also have a number that is monitored whenever the offices at Ripon Halls are closed. So from 5 p.m. until 8 a.m. the next business day. So that means if it's fall break, Wednesday at 5 p.m., that phone is monitored 24 hours a day until we open the next day of business, um, in business hours. Um, and that number will get you hold of a hall director. And that hall director um, will be able to respond whether it's in West Hall, Wilmore, the residence halls, anywhere of that nature. So we have those numbers listed. Some of the people that may answer those phones, so I mentioned the hall director, so I want to make sure everybody's on the same, same knowledge base. The hall directors, we have about three and a half hall directors. So what I mean by that is we have three full-time hall directors. We also have a, a hall director that splits their time with us and missions in the CBI. Um, but they are full-time professional live-in staff members. So that means they already have their degree. They're not they're no longer students. They go through six weeks of yearly training. So that is yearly training that they get every year as a refresher, as an update on what is the student concerns across the country, what's the student concerns in Wisconsin, what do we need to be acknowledging. And in that training, they get trained on emergency response, they get Narcan training, so Narcan is some, something we can administer if someone has an opioid overdose. They learn how to mediate, they learn about how to get facilities um, involved, and they also have crisis response. They are also trained with uh, the police on how to, what to do during an active shooter situation. They are also trained for CPR and first aid, um, which has also helped that first line of, of, of emergency response. We also have 31 RAs. That's a number I am extremely proud of. 31 RAs, we have about roughly what, 750, 100 students. That is a 25 to one student to RA ratio. That is one of the highest in the state, if not the highest. Um, and that is because so many of our students live on campus. We have such a high ratio. Because of that high ratio, we have some of the quickest emergency response rates um, in the state as well, too. Because we have an RA in every single floor, if not two RAs on every single floor. So it's easy access to get to emergency response. The RAs are also trained on mediation roommate conflict, CPR, first aid certified. We also bring in the police to help train with them, with uh, uh, 
active shooter training, um, how to spot for uh, drug concerns or narc narcotics. Then we also have them get trained on how to use fire extinguishers and fire suppression, bring some outside resources on how to train them on that kind of response. They perform nightly rounds, three to four rounds every single night. And that is to, to, um, to help build a community. It's not there to, to catch people and to actually do anything wrong, but to let people know that we are around, we're available if you need anything, if you have any concerns. They are also CSAs and mandatory reporters, which is something that is not universal to all RAs across the country. So what, what is that? CSAs. A CSA is a campus security authority. What that means is if a RA sees a crime or an incident, they are mandated to, re to report it up. They cannot overlook it, they cannot turn the other way. They have to report it. Same thing with mandatory reporters. As an RA, if an RA overhears of a Title IX incident, a sexual assault, or a suspicion, they have to report that up and have to report that to the Title IX coordinator. They are not allowed to, to overlook it. But, um, and they don't need to be told directly about it, but if they have suspicion of something happened, they have to report it, and that is by, by law. That is by Title IX. So that is something unique to the RA. So they are in that, it's a tough situation, they are in that unique situation of, of reporting. One big thing that we also do to finish up is we also help do the theory report. So the theory report is every college and university in the country, all 4,300 some of us, we have to report a theory report every year. This is an annual security report that details any crimes, suspicions, drugs, alcohol, whatever, you name it, um, on a yearly basis. I sent that out, uh, I think on September 29th. It must go out before October 1st every single year. You should have all received that. Um, and I, I cannot answer specifics on it, but if you have any questions, I'd love to, to address anything that you might have regarding the theory report. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to Chief Wall. Thanks, Mark. If you don't mind, I'm gonna stand up a little bit here, stretch. As Maria, uh, we talked a little bit about um, the survey, and one of the things that was brought up in the survey was that there wasn't a lot of contact between students and the Ripa Police Department. That's probably a good thing, right? Um, hopefully, that's a good thing, speaks volumes of the safety of the campus and the community. But we thought it was important as we started discussing this to share a little bit of information with you about what we're about. How we train our officers, some topics that have come up lately that are important for us to discuss, and really just tell you a little bit about what we are and, and what we're about. So obviously we're a full-time police department where we service this community 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and we provide the law enforcement services for the campus community. We've talked a little bit of today and we mentioned in the survey there is you do have some security that exists on the campus, but if there's a law enforcement function or there's a crime committed or some type of offense or something that happens that's a little bit more serious, we're responsible for that. We provide the services for the campus for that law enforcement process. Anybody can contact us through the communication center, whether it's calling 911 or the non-emergency number 748-2888. That's generally how we're on campus. You will not probably in most likelihood see our officers up walking the hallways and dorms or the buildings. Um, we're generally here on the campus as a result of some type of call for service. Now those calls can come in in a variety of ways. They can come in from a student so um, calling to report some type of activity or offense or need some help or some assistance in some manner or it may be faculty or or staff or even parents or friends outside of the campus calling us to maybe do a check on somebody or, or something like that but generally when you see our officers up on campus it's a result of us being called here for some reason now, occasionally the officers will swing through you know we saw some comments on the on the survey about security at night, so sometimes the officers will maybe swing through the quads um, or in, in the drive-through areas with a squad, so you might see that, but generally most calls that the officers that you see them in the hallways or those areas are a result of the service. Who we are, we are four, 14 officers in our department and included in that department, we have obviously myself, the chief, uh, I have a captain of operations, 
Uh, some sergeants that provide supervision when we're not there during the evening hours. We have an investigator who happens to be Investigator Harry. Um, we've mentioned her a couple times. We have a school resource officer combined with a community liaison to try to do some more community outreach. That's uh, Officer Michaels. She fulfills that position for us as well. And then we have our patrol staff. I see some stars there by that. Our patrol staff is kind of a hybrid because, because of the size of our department, we require that our officers are really trained across the board in a variety of things. We don't have a lot of specialty assignments like maybe larger departments might have a crime scene team that comes out and processes a, team, a scene or a photography team that comes and does that. Our officers need to be informed and educated on all those things because they may have to go through that entire scene and process that entire case based on their training. So we, so we make sure that they are cross-trained in a lot of things. I will argue that right now we're probably the most highly trained and highly educated department that this community has ever had. We have several members of our department with master's degrees. We have multiple officers with uh, bachelor's degrees. Um, that, and from an education standpoint, uh, but we're, I would stack this crew up against just about any other department in the area. They do fine work and they're a really outstanding group of people. Some of the things that we look for when we're, you know, we talked about our basic requirements for how we bring somebody on to our department. And obviously there's some state mandated qualifications that we need to have to have those officers on, on our department. Um, each officer has to go through a state mandated uh, recruit academy, 720 hours. Once they're done with that, um, that's, and those guidelines in reference to that are all dictated by the state of Wisconsin, they then come back to us. We put them through a 12 week training period where they're with another officer for that entire time. Um, once they com successfully complete that, then they're on a year long probation period for us. So the investment in that officer when they first come to us. It used to be my old chief would uh, always tell me a story about his first day on. They handed him a squad car keys and said, go out and patrol. Okay. Times have changed and we don't do that anymore. We don't want to put the community or officers in a position of failure, so we make sure that we do that. We also do our required monthly trainings that we all participate in, and then we have specialty trainings depending on an assignment for an officer. When we're looking for officers, The number one thing that we look for in the hiring of a new officer is, anybody guess? Character. Go ahead, and the next one. We can train our officers to do all those things that we talk about as far as tactics, about safety, about policies and procedures. But the most important thing we look for when we're interviewing candidates for a new officer position within our department is character. We look for those things. We look through those internal character things that define who they are. Because that's the more, most important trait for us. Again, we'll train you to do all those other things, but you have to bring that internal character, and that's the most important thing. Sometimes when we talk about training of our officers, things happen um, throughout the course of, of time. You know, Alan uh, Johnson talked a little bit about that, about the changes in law enforcement. Some things, sometimes things happen for us to take an internal look at what we do and how we're doing. And that sometimes dictates our training that we talk about within our department. Obviously, things over the last several years have talked about use of force. We've seen a lot of topics about that, so we need to address those things. We've talked about impartial and bias-based training, and, and we've done some of that with our officers. Active threat response training, mental health, so mental health awareness and training. These are all things that, during the course of my career, in the last 30 years, that have all changed, and we didn't talk about any of these things when I first came on to the job 30 years ago. So these are all things that, that have changed in regard to law enforcement. We kind of take pride in ourselves in, in our department about being willing to invest in our officers, get those new changes and evaluate new programs and initiatives as they come and as we need to address things. 
How are we policing? How are we doing things? What policies and procedures do we need to change to make the way that we're delivering our service better? Class 6 example of this is one of the things that we're really proud of. Several things. We were one of the first, um, well, we were the first agency within the county, one of the first agencies in the state of Wisconsin to issue all of our officers body cameras. Um, there are still departments in this area that don't have body cameras working towards that, but we were one of the first in the state to do that with every single one of our officers. Our opioid awareness resource program. Uh, we realized early on as we were battling this opioid awareness situation that we could not arrest our way out of that. So we entered into a, an agreement with an opioid awareness um, um, program that was able to, we were able to get people into treatment and options right away and we would be out on a scene with somebody begging for help and we didn't have resources to be able to do that. So we entered an agreement with several other factions to be able to do that and deliver that service right away, realizing that we simply just couldn't arrest our way out of that situation. So we want to be leaders and not followers when it comes to those type of concerns or those types of issues within our community and we realize that we may be initiative, initiating things that others law enforcement aren't doing, so it's very important for us. Again, our relationship with Ripley College has been exceptional. You heard a couple people say some very kind words, and we really appreciate that. Um, two officers that we've mentioned today, Lindsay and Kaylee, are, are uh, alumni. Both of those officers came to us as part of the internship program with Ripley College. So they came to us as, as interns initially through the college program, and then built relationships with us and eventually came to work with us. So that's been a really great program for us. We continue to do that. We have an intern this semester that's working with Officer Michaels up at the school. So a very, very good uh, program with us and uh, continue to do that. Again, it's about building those successful relationships and that partnership with the college and the college community. And we, we very much take pride in some of the other things that we've done with the campus community, um, obviously you heard Mark talk a little bit about our RA and staff training. Uh, generally we'll supply officers to do that at the beginning of the year before the students come back to campus. Uh, we've done some safety meeting with the re resident life coordinator. We've had a citizens academy in the past where we've had some representation from the college attend that. Um, our shop with emergency personnel is coming up. Um, that's a community program where we um, help out with uh, less fortunate people in the community, and sometimes we have some Ripon College people that have helped us with that rep presence or whatever. We're actually doing a project this coming weekend with, with uh, Coach Kane and some of his group um, to help somebody in the community with a yard cleanup, so we hope that that's going to be really successful as well. Um, one of the things we did this year is we had our national night out event, and we did a Cones, Cones with the Cops event where we provided free ice cream at various places in the community and one of those nights we drove the ice cream truck and ice cream up to the campus and, and handed out free uh, ice cream out to, to uh, students up at the campus so that was really good for us as well. Contact information for us obviously you can contact myself, Officer Michaels or Officer Heron anytime they're very familiar with the campus as well. You can reach us at those emails and that contact number. I would also encourage you to follow us on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, you know that's the stuff, right? But uh, we're on that, um, and, and certainly check out our website as well. So we'll be around after the presentation if you have any questions for us, and um, appreciate everybody showing up today and coming out. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Wow. Okay, so it's like our final minutes here, and we're running a little behind, I'm aware, Maria. Um, but guys, you can't give me the microphone right at the end. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank Alan Johnson. Um, I really believe that history is often in the hands of those who are telling it. And so I think it's really important to note um, what you were sharing about the history of policing that like, it really began, you said, by looking for white big males, you know, and that you mentioned that they were um, corruptible. And so I, what I like to, I like to call a spade a spade. And so I see just a system of power um, and what I like to call systemic racism, even from the beginning of policing that kind of, you said, carried on. It got more organized in the 60s during the civil rights movement. 
Um, but then that, that part about the 80s, um, the war on drugs, that really got to me because you said something about they kept locking people up. Um, but the reality is they kept locking up, arresting, and sentencing at a disproportionate rate black males. And so an entire generation lost their fathers, their sons, their um, providers. And so I just, I think it's, we could do a whole talk on history there and really dig in. Um, but I'm part of a community group that's really a lot about education. And so um, thanks for bringing up some of that. I wish we could talk more about that. Um, but my name is Mandy, and um, this topic's really um, personal for me. I don't know how to talk about it at a panel. I wish we could all just like have coffee and like cry and laugh and talk because this is just way too formal and way too um, weird to do something this important in this way. But I often think it's kind of like a catalyst, like it's taking one step. And so my hope is that this panel will create opportunities for you guys to talk to one another, for you to take a next step, to talk to someone else here because um, a panel's really not gonna do much unless we let it do something. Um, but I'm really thankful I get to share. Um, so I, we're part of the Ripon Area Racial Justice Alliance. Um, and if you could just fast forward to like the second slide, not this one, but the next one. Um, after George Floyd was murdered, I just had this deep feeling that something had to happen. Um, and I was late to the game, but I was just like, I'm not gonna let my life just go on like it's normal. I can't, like this interrupted my life forever. And so I started to look for different events or marches or things I could participate in. And honestly, there wasn't anything happening here in Ripon. Um, I started commuting out of town. <laughs> and um, I went to this panel in Green Bay and there was a, a panel with a police chief of Appleton there. Oh, actually it was in Appleton. And there was this moment where this panelist explained that he felt so helpless as he watched George Floyd be murdered on this video because he saw that that could have been him or that could have been his son. Um, and there was a moment in that panel where one of the protesters that had been on the street the day before came up and spoke. And the end, at the end of the day, the panelist, the protester and the chief of police were hugging and crying and talking together. And so I know that things like that can happen um, when we get personal. And so, um, yeah, so I started to feel this need to bring something like that to Ripon. And I started to talk to my um, friends in the community that are um, the BIPOC community, the minority members, and I just said, how are you feeling? Um, and we had already talked about this way before, like lots of times before, but especially with everything that was happening, I said, what, what are you feeling? And they're like, you know, Mandy, people just keep saying that racism is just not an issue here, that Ripon's just so great, everyone's fine, um, but that's not been my experience. And I, and I said, you know, what if we had an event where people, real people, with real stories, came forward and shared the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so that's the event that we had that day, and it was terrifying and scary, and people wouldn't even give us like an insurance policy because they thought we were gonna riot, like it was nuts. But it happened, and what's cool out of an event, because one event won't change anything, all these little conversations started happening. Um, I spoke with someone who owns the heist downtown, and he's like, and I just kept being like, Sam, we gotta do something, Sam, we gotta do something, and, and, and he felt led to paint this mural. And so um, that, you can go back to the first slide. Out of all of those things that were happening, we decided we needed to create um, an organization that would keep the conversation going. Um, because this is actually um, not just a moment in time, but this is something that is a marathon. It's, a, it's not a sprint. We need to keep the conversation happening. And so what we've done is we've had some vigils for victims of racial violence and police brutality. Um, we had the event where people stood and shared um, their truth about what had happened to them living in Ripon. Um, we worked to save the Black Lives Matter mural. It was a real fun time at the city council. Lots of people signed petitions and showed up. It was awesome. Um, and then we have monthly meetings where really we gather for education, where we want to have ongoing conversations about racial justice. Um, and what we want to see happen, um, if you go to the next slide, is yes, we want to just keep working on this. And so this is just one little step. We love that we get to be part of this. Um, we want to provide a platform to amplify BIPOC voices in Ripon. Um, we want to bring the college community together with the local community. Um, we want to do education. We want to learn about the real history of policing or the real history of, of um, the native lands we live on or so many different topics. Um, but even just today, I was thinking about what's going on where I, I know right now my friend that's a supervisor at Alliance knows that he's going to hear the N-word almost every single day at his job. 
I know another one of my friends has never gotten a call back about renting an apartment here because he sounds like he's not from here and they just don't trust him. Um, and I know that my friends are afraid to walk into stores in downtown because of the way that they're looked at. And so this is still a real issue and there are real stories. Um, but I'm encouraged to hear just um, what's happening here at the college, like that there's so much support, that there's um, these actions are being taken. I've got to sit down with Sergeant Lindsay and just ask her about her heart. Um, one thing I would love to hear, because I've asked a little bit about the bias training, is like who has had the incident and bias training and what things did you guys learn? And so maybe we can, because um, what I've known is that it was an elective and I didn't know who would have it. So that would be cool to find out. But I'm just thankful um, and I could talk more, but I'll stop. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we're kind of running a little short on time, so maybe if, if you can all kind of maybe, don't necessarily have to answer this, but think about these questions here. Um, what is your hope for community, police community relations? Uh, what new understanding or common ground did you find within this topic? Has this conversation changed your perception of anyone in this group, including yourself? And is there a next step that you would like to take based on the conversations you've had? So, Maybe kind of think about that a little bit, and I don't know if we have a, time, a quick little time for questions from the crowd, about five minutes. Okay, so if anybody in, in the audience would like to ask any questions of me or the other panelists up here, um, I don't know if you can wave me back and walk a microphone out to you. See, so hand in front, which is a shorter walk, so. So my question, I guess, is kind of related to the history, too, and also um, for the police officers in general. You talked about, like, preventing crime. I'm just kind of curious, too, as to when it seemed like um, like the police department went above, like, um, necessarily preventing crime or um, solving crimes necessarily, and more also about, like, community outreach and, like, helping with, like, medical emergencies and other stuff that doesn't necessarily, like, relate to crime necessarily. Sure. Uh, if, I, if I understand your question, um, I will tell you that the concept of policing, specifically what we do, has dramatically changed over the last 25 years. Um, Professor Johnson is correct that we used to hire for strength and can you drag this bad guy to jail type thing. Now, really, the job that we do is so much more influenced by the social work aspect of what we need to do for our communities and be involved in that, um, that that really drives a per greater percentage of what we do on a daily basis. The, the fact is that it's not about just arresting people anymore. It's about solving problems. And, and our job, quite frankly, is much more involved with the social work aspect People that we're involved with than it is about arresting and taking people to jail. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I guess um, to flip on that, what are some things that I mean to the social work aspect that can like be improved upon with that? Like you said, you are a small department in that aspect, but there's uh, so many aspects to the job. Yeah, yeah, probably I would say the, one of the biggest things right now that law enforcement across the board is dealing with is mental health issues. Uh, that system, quite frankly, is broken. It's overwhelmed. Uh, I would say that our calls for mental health over the last 20 years have probably gone up 300%. We are dealing with mental health issues every single day. Um, whether that's welfare checks or suicidal subjects or whatever the case may be, alcohol, drug abuse, the mental health system right now in this nation needs to be seriously looked at because it's overwhelmed and it can't keep up and we're dealing with it more than we've ever dealt with it before. So that's one prime example. My question is for all panelists, whoever feels they're too to answer. I am wondering what the college as well as the community is doing to directly impact the education and well-being of the community in terms of racial justice and awareness and lowering the racial bias that 
both the community at the college and the community in general Griffin may have that impacts the safety of our BIPOC brothers and sisters. I would um, start out with is, and I noticed Kara was able to join us earlier, is um, college has done a lot here in the last year to two years trying to look at different types of diversity here on the campus and programs and things that we can do to support that. So a very serious effort has been made towards personnel and some of the hires we've made that have really turned out to be very, very successful. And I think actually, Maria and her department have been given additional resources and brought a lot of attention to a lot of these details, and, and including a lot of support for people. That's been a big piece of what's down there. Um, six years ago, we didn't really even have a Center for Diversity and Inclusion on campus, and that kind of felt that that was a real gap. So I, I feel like there's great strides uh, in that direction. As far as the community, the whole community is invited to be part of RAR, we call it RAR job. So we do monthly meetings um, to do education, we do different events to just keep putting that issue forward. Um, but there's lots more to be done, um, for sure. We have time for another question. for law enforcement um, panelists, and I was wondering, um, kind of how with Griffin College we have a bias to the report. If you feel maybe you had an interaction with the law enforcement personnel when you felt targeted or you felt like um, it didn't go the right way, is there um, a way to report that? Or And then I also wanted to know if yes, if there is, is it anonymous? How does that um, process go? Yeah, we have a formal, if you ever feel that way, you have an issue with an officer, we have a formal complaint process um, that requires an independent investigation into those complaints. So certainly anybody is able to do that. Um, you don't need to provide your information if you're doing that, um, but a lot of times if there's gonna be an investigation into the conduct of an officer, we need to be able to talk to somebody and figure out what the facts of the case are. There is, um, uh, a formal policy that we have in regards to our internal investigations and any type of complaint against the officers. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, so do you just call, like, the police department? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you can call or you can stop down and, and they'll hand you the form and the policy, copy of the policy, and, and uh, or you can email me specifically, um, and certainly that gets the, the ball rolling. You bet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, everyone in the, in the panel, President Bissetti, Professor Jensen, Dr. Obama, and we're going to have a quick wrap up. It's time for lunch. Please make sure you grab your lunch back there. Um, everyone should have a ticket with numbers on it. The first raffle goes to, there's some really cool raffle prices back there. Um, Seven five nine four three seven. Seven five nine four four zero. Do we have a winner? Yay, we have a winner. We go back to the great prize. Seven five nine four four one. We have another winner. And please stick around and have a conversation with our panelists. Thanks everyone for coming. 759447. Okay. Is that you? Awesome. We'll do a couple more. 759450. Is that you back there? Awesome. And one more. I think we have one more. 